I took a picture of this bulletin board and it said, I still believe in global warming, do you? And then if you go to heartland.org, it's a, it's a coal um, website. So just letting you know, okay. So um, reconstructing the past, what, what happened, you know, let's say 100,000 years ago, or maybe 1.5 million years ago, he used tree rings, he used corals like Jacques Cousteau did, um, but the best the best way to go back to further some really good accurate data is, is ice core samples either from Greenland or from Antarctica. In Greenland, you go back around 75,000 years. In Antarctica, you go back about 1.5 million years ago. And what happens is that that atmosphere becomes trapped in little bubbles in the ice. And they're there forever. So when you do an ice core and you bring it up, you could actually look at what the atmosphere was in say 500,000 years ago. And you could actually see what the levels of CO2 were and actually have a good idea what the temperature was doing by looking at the different isotopes of oxygen. It's kind of really, really cool. So if you remember one graph, this is the graph to remember. And this goes back around 500,000 years ago. And on this axis is the carbon dioxide level, parts per million, and you could see that for hundreds of thousands of years, even before we were on this earth, the CO2 level never got beyond 300 parts per million. All right? Until recently. And now it's off the chart. But also remember, look at this. Every 100,000 years, 100,000 years is a long time. You know, it really is. <laughs> but every 100,000 years, there's this peak of CO2, and not only that, but a decrease in CO2. See that every 100,000 years? And there's other patterns. If you look really closely, there's a 41,000 year pattern and a 23,000 year pattern. You know, basically over the 100,000 year cycle. And, and these are natural cycles, and this is caused by the sun, by the way. And this absolutely causes global warming, periods of global warming, and ice ages. Without a doubt, natural, 100,000 years. Okay, does that all make sense? Now, I thought this was so cool. At Diablo Canyon, we're built on a coastal terrace, and this is also called a wave cut platform, and it's 85 feet up. And if you look, when this was cut, about 120,000 years ago, we were in a period of global warming and that raised sea levels about 90 feet over to what we're seeing today. And those higher sea levels is what carved out this wave cut platform on this coastal terrace, 85 feet. And that cool just lines up like that, all right? Now, um, we should be, if you come right here, we should be in another period of cooling. Maybe that's where that author got it, or the you know, global cooling, how to survive it. But because of man-made CO2, we're pushing 414, 415 parts per million CO2. I mean, it's beyond hockey stick. It's just straight up. So we've never seen levels of CO2 like this in our whole existence on this Earth. All right? Okay, so natural variation, orbital cycles. You have elasticity. And the Earth's orbit around the sun is not perfect. It varies about every 100,000 years. So it expands and contracts. It expands and contracts, just like a jellyfish in the ocean. And this causes global warming and global cooling, but a 100,000-year cycle, all right? The other one is axle tilt, and that's a 41,000-year cycle. And that's basically we're 23.5 degrees, but this varies every 41,000 years. Another one is precession, which is the wobbling of the Earth on its axis. That's about every 23,000 years. So these are natural cycles that once again causes global cooling and global warming. Okay, so this graph goes back since the Industrial Revolution in 1880. And the black line is what global temperatures are doing. And the yellow or orange line is essentially what the output from the sun is. And the idea here is that to justify this type of warming, the sun's output would have to also increase at the same amount. And it's not. That's called forcing, all right? Another one is at the Earth's orbit. And you can see that if we bet, went back 100,000 years ago, you would definitely see this forcing this. But since we're only going back since the Industrial Revolution, 
that doesn't explain why global temperatures are increasing to such an extent. Okay, is it volcanoes? And boy, volcanoes put out a lot of CO2. They also put out a lot of aerosols. And aerosols are important because in the atmosphere, as the sunlight comes through, a lot of that sunlight is reflected right back into space. So it's kind of a wash. If you took all three together, it still doesn't justify what's going on with global temperatures. All right? Okay, the 10 hottest years, all since 1998. And just today, <laughs> I was listening to Rush Limbaugh, and he was talking about this and saying, no, it hasn't warmed up since 1998. I couldn't believe I heard it, but I heard it, okay? So um, 2010 was the warmest year on record, and then 2014 came, and it was warmer than 2010. 2015 and 2016 occurred during a very strong El Nino event, you might remember. But it literally shattered, shattered our temperature records. And then what happened last year? Well, 2019 turns out to be the second warmest year on record. And it's not even an El Nino year. It's an El Nothing, or neutral <laughs> condition, or La Nada year. And this really shook a lot of people up. We never thought that we would see record-breaking temperatures during a non-El Nino year. This doesn't make any sense, all right? Okay, this July 2019 was the Earth hottest month on record of any year dating back since 1880, the Industrial Revolution. And it wasn't so bad here along the Central Coast, but if you had to be traveling to Europe, it was absolutely miserable, especially in France. I mean, in Paris, they're up to 114 degrees. Can you imagine that? All right. So here's a map of the United States, and this is showing the, the temperature change since 1895. And if you look closely, part of the country in the south has actually diminished as a smidgen. And that's probably um, because of greater amounts of rainfall, is what we're thinking that happened there. But other parts of the country have really increased in temperature, and especially from Los Angeles, up to Point Conception Hollister Ranch has really gone up quite a bit. And people ask, why is that? You know, this is really undeveloped property if you've ever been in that part of Point Conception, Point South, Point Agrello. And so what's happening as the earth warms, the thermal low, which is a static low in the Central Valley, becomes more intense. Um, you know, as you, air, as you heat air, it becomes less dense and it ascends into the atmosphere, it's an area of low pressure. Not a dynamic low, you know, it won't produce a storm, but it's a static low, all right? Now, off the coast of California, it's been called the Eastern Pacific High, and it's an area of high pressure, and it's really a, a, a fixed future of, of our weather pattern. Very important. So nature never likes anything out of balance, so when you have an area of low pressure in the Central Valley during the spring, summer, and fall, an area of high pressure off the coastline, you have these strong northwesterly winds. And boy, if you live in Santa Maria, you're probably really familiar with those northwesterly winds, right? Now, as those northwesterly winds blow down the coastline, they produce upwelling, which means that you're bringing up that cold, deep water from the ocean depths right to the shoreline. And that produces cooler air temperatures. It also produces more kelp growth, you know, because it's, it's like fertilizer. Now, if you look at San Luis Obispo, Santa Maria, the temperature hasn't gone up that much. But when you go on the other side of the San Rafael Range, and you have those downslope winds, those adiabatic winds that basically they, they heat up 5.5 degrees for every thousand feet of descent, look at the temperature anomaly there. So I think what's going on with stronger northwesterly winds that's keeping this part of the coastline relatively normal, but further south we're seeing tremendous temperature increases, all right? Now, is this a trace gas? I think of each molecule of CO2 like a feather and a down comforter, helping to trap heat in the atmosphere. Um, the same amount of carbon monoxide in our air would kill all of us right now. So even though it's a trace gas, if it was carbon monoxide, we wouldn't be here right now, okay? Now, here's a great painting. It's called American Gothic. It was painted during the Great Depression, and they're pretty serious, right? They probably haven't been drinking. I bet they're pretty sober. But they have a commercial driver's license. 
If you have a blood alcohol content of 0 0.04, 400 parts per million, guess what? That's driving under the influence. You'll be spending some time in jail, okay? Even though it's a trace gas or, or a trace molecule. Okay, they said it was cooling in 1970, so pay close attention. Here is a cover of Time magazine that was supposedly released back in 1976, and I'm sure a lot of us uh, probably remember MASH. It was such a great show. And then Carol Burnett over here in the left-hand corner. But the cover said, How to Survive the Coming Ice Age. 51 Things You Could Do to Make a Difference. Here's the real cover. And this is back in the late 90s, Tony Soprano there in the corner, right? And the real cover was the Global Warming Survival Guide. 51 Things You Could Do to Make a Difference. So when you look at climate data and information, you got to be a critical thinker. You got to really research this stuff because there is a lot of propaganda out there. Okay, the science has been around for more than a century. Uh, John Tidell was uh, out of Ireland and just a marvelous scientist. And he discovered that, well, the air that we breathe is around 87% nitrogen, N2, and 21% oxygen, O2, and then 1% everything else. All right? And these are simplistic or cynical molecules, meaning that when the sun's light inter doesn't interact with these molecules, doesn't interact with, with N2 or O2. You know, uh, maybe a good analogy would be a, a cheese shredder that's reversed and you rub the cheese on, nothing happens, right? There's just no interaction. But he did discover that CO2 or H2O has a tremendous amount of interactivity with the sun's radiation. So it's like turning that cheese grater back on the other side. It's just shedding, you know, grating cheese like there's no tomorrow. And he discovered that. And then follow up with Arianus, with August, from Sweden. And we still use a lot of his equations at Diablo Canyon in the chemistry lab. Both of these folks were just, you know, geniuses, right? They're way, way in, in front of the science. And, oh, about 100 years ago, Arianus wrote this. He goes, the furnaces of the world are now burning about 2 billion tons of coal a year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds around 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the air a more efficient blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature. The effect may be significant in a few decades or in a few centuries. I'm sorry about that. But he wrote this more than 100 years ago. So this is not old science. It's, it's been around for a long, long time. And in fact, the equation that he wrote, it's still proving to be accurate, even more so than some of the supercomputers and the modeling, believe it or not. All right, so it's snowing somewhere. I always say it's snowing up in Ukiah. You know, how can it be getting hotter, right? But when you look at climate change, you look at global warming, you look at weather, you want to look at long-term trends. You just don't want to take one Pacific weather episode and say, ah, oh, there is no such thing as climate change or there is climate change. You really want to look at the long-term trends. So the way I look at it is weather is one play in a baseball game. Climate is the history of Major League Baseball. That's a really strong analogy. All right, the thermometers are all wrong. Have you heard that before? So I started my career on the Central Coast at Diablo Canyon, the Ocean Lab. And this is, you know, basically we're right here in Santa Maria, Pismo Beach, and Morro Bay going up towards Cambria. But Diablo is right about there. And we have 35 biological and temperature monitoring stations up and down the Pecho Coast that goes to the Point San Luis Lighthouse up to Montana de Oro, the Point Bichon. And we take three readings per hour, 24-7. And we start our database, database way back in 1975. So it's a huge database, all right? And I calibrated, I deployed, I retrieved, I archived all this temperature data. I worked with a gentleman named Einar Anderson. And Einar Anderson was a Caltech graduate, and he was meticulous in his calibrations and his precision. So that's where I learned all this stuff from, was from Einar, who passed away a few years ago, okay? So the previous two record readings for seawater temperatures was back in 1983, a strong El Nino year, in fact a very strong El Nino year, 66.65 degrees. Then in 1997, another very strong El Nino year, we got to 66.72 degrees. 
But then, in 2015, the temperature reached 67.58 degrees. If somebody told me we'd ever see temperatures of this magnitude along our coastline, I would never, ever believe them. You know, and, the, and this is a demo to show you how significant that really is. Come over here. So, here's an air balloon. And I bet you could give me a hypothesis that when I hold a flame underneath this air balloon, it's going to probably pop, right? You most of you agree? I'm excited. I do, anyway. So, let's see here. I mean, no surprise, right? Okay, what do you think is going to happen? I know our librarian's probably kind of nervous right now. <laughs> <laughs> this balloon is filled up with water. I filled it up right over there at that sink. How how incredibly convenient that is. And I can hold up this I can hold this flame underneath this balloon all day long and it will never ever pop. Because the water has so much more heat capacity than air does. And it's taking the heat the heat away from this flame and transfer it to the water. It'll never pop, all right? So I want to show you these temperatures. If I can come and do this. Right, right over here. When I show you these temperatures, you know, when you, when you think about the heat capacity of, of water, this is insane. And this is unbelievable. Um, when we calibrate our temperature recorders, we do it in a water bath because the, the water is such a better medium to do calibrations in. So I, I, I can just tell you, this is, this is remarkable to see these water temperatures increase to this point. You know, I used to be a climate skeptic for many years, right? I didn't believe this stuff, because I always was sort of a doubting Thomas. And when I looked at this data, it, it kind of shook me up, to be honest with you. Y yes, sir? What would the average temperature be? Um, normally, we're about 54.75. So there, there you go. All right, uh, monthly, thanks for the question, sir. Also, monthly, average monthly Arctic sea ice extent. The first ship to make it to the North Pole was the USS Nautilus. It was a nuclear-powered submarine. In fact, the first nuclear-powered ship in the entire world was Admiral Rickover's baby. And they tried to make it to the North Pole in June, but the ice was too thick. And they tried again in July, but unfortunately the ice was still too thick. But finally in August, they were able to get through the ice pack and sail underneath the North Pole in August of 1958. It's a remarkable thing. Nobody had ever done that before. And since that time, the Navy's kept pretty good records of what the ice extent is up in the Arctic Ocean. And this year, like last year, there's actually tankers selling with liquefied natural gas to the north, Northwest Passage without an icebreaker. You know, that's another thing we would never realize that would happen. So anyway, uh, this goes back since 1978 to present. And you see that some years, yeah, the ice extension or ice extent goes up, some years it goes down, some years it goes up, some years it goes down. That's why you want to look at long-term trends, because if I wanted to make an argument, I'll look. Look at this, from 1994 to 1997, that ice is, you know, look how much it's increased, right? That's my argument if, if I want to make that. But it's, it's an erroneous argument. You really got to look at those long-term trends, and you can see where the trending line's going, okay? Um, I started out in the Navy as a search and rescue crewman on helicopters. Then I got old and got fat and finished up in P-3 Orions, which is our long-range maritime patrol aircraft and it became an AG, an auger mate, a weather forecaster. And um, we would go to Japan from Point Magoo, we'd fly across the Pacific Ocean to Japan. And uh, what we found, and actually I spent two summers up in Alaska mining for gold and chicken Alaska of all things, right? And um, our crew had about 15 people on board, that P-3 Orion. And I just remember so many of the crew members saying, my gosh, Look how these glaciers have receded, just using their own eyes. Nothing scientific is looking at their own eyes, and this is Muir Glacier, and, and just look at the difference here over, over the years. Um, this is Josh Willis with JPL, um, with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA, and this past summer he was at Greenland, and he told me that the air temperature in Greenland reached over 80 degrees. 
and I do whatever thought, right? And what's so fascinating about this is that not only are you getting melt from, from the high temperatures, but these glaciers, a lot of these glaciers extend five or 6,000 feet down into the Arctic Ocean. And these are bathothermic rock buoys. They're launching from a, um, from a C-130 or, or a C-1, C, what's it, C-9, a bird that flew in World War II, but they converted with turboprops. And what they found, well, up, up in the Arctic, the temperature is isothermal, which means that the temperature of the surface is the same as it is like three or 4,000 feet down. The problem is the salt water column is increasing in temperature, and that's in direct contact with those glaciers. And if all the ice was to melt on Greenland, uh, seawater levels would come up around 25, 26 feet, believe it or not. So it's very problematic. All right, when I went to, when I went to Japan, um, I found out, learned, that rice is a really big deal in Japan. It's huge. But another big deal is cherry blossoms. And this graph goes back about 800 years, and they've kept really good records on the peak of the cherry blossom bloom. That's a, that's a big event in Japan. And what they, and this is in, in Tokyo, Japan, and this is March and April, and you can see since the Industrial Revolution, the peak of the cherry blossoms are becoming earlier and earlier. Now it's, yeah, it's all the way in the March now, and that's because of a warming atmosphere. Um, this is at Montana de Oro, that coastal um, wave cut platform, and I was there taking photographs one day. This is Earth Day, actually. And I saw these two people capturing rattlesnakes. It turns out there were two Cal Poly students in the biological department. And um, she's got her PhD now, and he's working on his master's. But that's a rattlesnake, and they're capturing male rattlesnakes. And um, I have a bad thumb here, don't I? Okay. So what they do is they implant uh, GPS chips and um, thermistors in these rattlesnakes. During the winter months, they go in kind of a semi-hibernation. Then during the spring, they come out and they look for a mate. And it's about a two square mile range that they have, a two square mile range. And what they found is these rattlesnakes, these male rattlesnakes are coming out earlier and earlier each year, which means not only is the atmosphere warming up, but this earth is warming up also. Okay, climate science says it can predict the exact temperature in 50 years within a half a degree, but needs a 1,000 mile margin of error for predicting the track of Irma. By golly, let that sink in, right? So I get that a lot. You know, John, how the heck can you tell me what's going to happen 100 years from now? You don't know what tomorrow's weather's going to be like, right? And, um, you know, in a way, I guess that's true sometimes. You know, predicting tomorrow's weather can be really difficult. And um, I was going on Los Osos Valley Road back to Los Osos, and there's a, um, a Target and Dick Sporting's Good and El Poro Loco. And the sun was behind me. I pulled over to get a great rainbow picture. But I didn't get a rainbow picture. I got this picture. And what this is, it's a snow coming down in San Luis Obispo about a year ago, believe it or not. <laughs> I didn't really predict that. But you know, if somebody asked me, hey, John, what's the weather going to be like in Avila Beach 100 years from now in the month of July? And I said, well, it's going to probably be foggy. And I'd probably be correct, right? <laughs> so that's how you sort of uh, predict uh, long-term cycles. All right, the climate scientists are trying to achieve worldwide domination, AKA Dr. Evil. And that's just wrong. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you go to JPL and you look at the parking lot, it's filled up with Toyotas and Chevrolets and Hondas. You know, if you really want to make some bucks, if you got a PhD in climate scientists or climate science, um, you know, work for a fossil fuel company. You'll make a lot more money than working for the government. All right? Okay, sea level increase. Now, when sea ice melts, it doesn't do squat. And ice is the only molecule that I know of that exists at room temperature that when it freezes, it expands. I have no, no other molecule that I know that does that. And it really makes life on Earth possible. If, if that wasn't its property, we'd be a big ice cube right now. So with an iceberg, 90% of that ice is below the water level, 10% is above. When it melts, it doesn't contribute at all to, to sea level rise, okay? However, when you have melting land ice, that's going to increase sea level. And when you have iceberg capping that, it, that increases sea level, 
Right now, most of the sea level that we're seeing is due to thermal expansion. So the warming of the oceans is causing the sea level to increase. And uh, during strong El Nino events, where seawater temperatures are warmer than normal, um, you'll actually see the actual uh, tide level about seven inches higher than the predicted tide level. All right? So here's a graph of all the tide gauges throughout the world since the Industrial Revolution. And if I drew a tending line, it would be 1.8 millimeters per year. If I went from 1880 to 1920, about 0.8 millimeters per year. If I went from 1920 to 1980, about 2 millimeters per year, but lately it's really accelerated up to about 3.2 millimeters per year of sea level increase. Now, PG&E, we brought together the finest meteorologists and climate scientists throughout the world because a lot of our infrastructure is at sea level. And we had to figure out as a company what sea level increase would mean for us. And we decided to go with the California SLR guidance average of all models. And we feel that by 2100, sea levels will be about 47 inches higher than they are today. And that seems to be working out pretty well. It seems like to be a pretty good prediction. And, uh, you know, I should have brought this for, um, I'll go through this really quick. Um, I'm going to talk about where I live in Los Osos, Baywood Park. And I live right about there. And this is the inundation. So if you're familiar with the Back Bay Inn and, and the uh, Baywood Inn, you can see how, how those two hotels are flooded out. Um, there's around 20 homes here that are flooded out. You guys ever heard of Cuesta by the Sea? It's, it's going to be Cuesta underneath the sea, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, heading a little bit further south, this is Diablo, 85 feet above sea level, really no impacts. Avila Beach, you know, that parking lot um, where the post office is, that's already starting to flood out now during high tide. Now, if you head further south, there's that trailer park in Pismo Beach, uh, Royal Grande, or, or Oceano. No, Grover Beach, yeah, Pismo Beach, Grover Beach. It uh, looks like it's going to be all flooded out. So it's not, it's only 88, well, it's only 80 years away. It's not that far, right? Um, of course, Caltrans has already had to redirect uh, Highway 1 going up towards Ragged Point um, because of severe coastal erosion. Now, air temperature change. Uh, we're thinking that by 2100, 80 years from now, the temperature will be about 6.2 degrees warmer than it is today in Fahrenheit. And anybody here in agriculture, agriculturalist by any chance? That's, that's huge. I mean, for cherry trees and a lot of your rock um, fruit, you, you need freezing temperatures during the winter. And if that doesn't happen, you don't get much fruit. So uh, another really um, pretty upsetting graph Unfortunately, this one seems to be lagging. It, it seems like the actual temperatures are rising faster than what this trend line is, okay? Um, wildfires, uh, this is on top of the Cuesta Gray, and this was taken around five years ago. And uh, longer term, the California Climate Change Center estimates of wildfire risk will increase about 300% by 2050 compared to 1990, 2000, it's average in terms of frequency and fire, and this has turned out to be completely true. Uh, it's, it's verified. It's much worse than people realize. I'm sure you've all seen movies, videos, news reports from Australia right now, and, and to see what's going on down there. Bankrupt my company. Hopefully, we'll come out of bankruptcy in this June. Is what I'm hoping to do. But we have 30 billion dollars in claims for wildfires. Just you want to know what the true cost of wild of climate change is. Boy, you're seeing it now. People that live in high fire risk areas, you may see a lot of those homes for sale because they can't afford the fire insurance, or they may not even be able to get fire insurance. And then people that write mortgages, underwriters aren't writing mortgages for for those locales. All right. Okay. On the flip side of this whole equation is uh, you know the Pineapple Express the atmospheric river, the turning on the hose, the meteorological circles. And this is California. Down here is the whole Hawaiian Islands, hence that's why we say the Pineapple <laughs> Express. This is water vapor in mid-upper levels of the atmosphere. Not, not water in its liquid form, but water in its gas form. And even though that's water vapor, it can actually transport about five Mississippis. 
pour more water than the Amazon River can. And back in 1862, there was a terrible flood here in California. It rained probably more than 100 inches in the month of January. And here's a photograph of Sacramento on 4th and K Street. In fact, it rained so much that the capital had to be moved to San Francisco. My relatives on my mom's side came over after the Donner Party and they settled out in a small little farming community called Calusa, and they were farmers. And they had to take refuge in the Sutter Buttes, the world's smallest mountain range. The, the whole Central Valley was flooded. You know, there was so much water coming out of the San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento, uh, the, well, the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento River going out the Golden Gate that there was a plume of brackish water that went all the way to the Farallon Islands. All communities in Los Angeles were washed away. And why I bring this up? Because the warmer the atmosphere, this is not a hypothesis or a theory, it's facts, it's a physical law. The warmer the atmosphere, the more water vapor it could hold. And when that water vapor condenses, you ever notice that before it snows or rains, it warms up? Because it's a warming process, it's latent heat, and that's what's really the engine for storms. So unfortunately, as we move forward, there's going to be a greater and greater chance of more intense storms. Now, when that flood happened in 1862, you know, the population in the Central Valley of California is probably one hundredth of, or maybe one thousandth of what it is today. I mean, you know how much it's really grown there. And you can see, this is from uh, Climate Central, that since 1950, rainfall events have become more intense. Okay, what pg &E is doing is that along the central coast, the greatest source of greenhouse gas by far is transportation. Now, something we can all be proud of, that between the Carrizo Solar, you know, the, the Topaz Solar Farm up in the Carrizo Plains and Diablo Canyon, we actually export out of the central coast around 18,000 gigawatts of energy per year. And we export more clean electricity than any other region in the United States. So I think that's really something to be proud of, all right? There is no fossil fuel generation here in the Central Coast. Um, back in 2017, I just want to say how clean the power that we deliver to our customers is. This year, it's about 90% is carbon free. So when you drive in an electric vehicle, that's really clean energy. But here's another really cool thing to look at. Here's our carbon footprint per person, and you can see that's been going down. But look at gross domestic product in California, that's been going up. So even though we go to a, a green economy, doesn't mean it's got to hurt the economy, right? Yes, sir, got a question back here? Well, why is that line been going down, the carbon footprint? This is uh, emissions per capita, per person. And it's been going down, but GM gross domestic product for California has been going up. So there, there you go. Now, what you could do is, you know, I purchased solar panels for my house. PG and gave me a thousand bucks. And probably more significant though is getting an EV. We have two EVs at home. We have a Ford Focus Electric and a Nissan Leaf. And my electric bill or my gas bill used to be like three hundred twenty dollars a month, and now it's nothing. Right? I, I um, don't pay for gas. We just pass the gas stations. We may get snacks or get a car wash, but that's pretty much it. These EVs only have 8% of the moving parts a regular car has, so consequently, um, there's just no maintenance. You gotta replace the tires and you gotta put windshield washer fluid in the, in the reservoir. Another thing too, internal combustion engines are about 19% efficient. These EVs are around 80% efficient. So right off the bat, you're, you're four times more energy efficient than you are with, with an internal combustion engine. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so the, well, I'll, I'll answer it at the end, all right? So the question was, what's that graph going to look like when Diablo Canyon closes, right? So it's a good, good, fair question. So anyway, you can pick up used EVs for less than 8000 bucks if you're thinking about getting them, but they are coming down in price every year. And uh, Tesla produced, I think, 370,000 automobiles last year and they're scheduled to produce around 700,000 automobiles this year. They're all electric vehicles, and they're built right here in California. Just, just remarkable, and you probably saw the Cybertruck, same size as an F-150, some people hate it, some people love it. Um, but that is gonna come out, the, the, low, the low price for that car is gonna be around 40K.
and it's going to have almost a 500 mile range. So you can kind of see where we're going on this, right? Okay, um, I got to hang out with Story Musgrave for two days at Diablo Canyon. He was an astronaut and he um, flew in all five shuttles. And um, what a story this guy was. He, he um, started out in the Marine Corps and he was a plane captain on the USS Wasp off the coast of Korea. And that was, that's what he was most proud of doing the aircraft inspections of these A7 Sky Raiders before they took off. He wasn't a pilot, but he was the maintenance guy. And that's what he was most proud of. But he had a, a real in curiosity. So guess what? He, should, he goes, he, after he got out of the Marines, he went to Syracuse. He introduced himself to the dean and said, hey, look, I've never been to school before, but I think I could do really well here. And the dean goes, what? He goes, don't you realize you can have a 4.0? And so he goes, well, I served in the U.S. Marine Corps. So the dean goes, okay, you're in, you know? <laughs> and he excelled. And he goes, you know, I wonder how the brain works. I'm really curious about it. This is a no kidding story. Look this guy up. He goes to UCLA, gets a, a PhD in neuroscience. Then he goes, you know, I bet I could really help out in an emergency room. So he completely revolutionized the ER. He made the, the basically, he, he developed the triage to keep people alive. And it was successful. Then he goes, you know what? I'm going to apply for NASA. <laughs> and they accepted him. They only accepted seven people out of like 25,000 applicants. And he went on the fly in all five um, space shuttle. And he, uh, he has more time in a Northrop T-38 jet trainer than any other human being on the face of the earth. Today he lives in Florida with his uh, grandkids and they raise thousands and thousands of palm trees. But when he went in orbit, the thing that shook him up the most, that he still talked about today, was just how thin the atmosphere was. That really, really kind of freaked him out. And a good example of this, here's an apple. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this apple in half. And the earth would be the white flesh. And the earth's atmosphere is the skin. That's the same ratio, the same scale that we're looking at today. You know, isn't it about time that as human beings that we finally, you know, fess up to that we're causing this? It's our problem. Even from speaking from a former climate skeptic, there's no doubt in my mind that we're causing this. And as my old CEO used to say, if we tackle this problem now, it's going to be a lot less expensive than if we keep kicking the can down the road. So I think it's about time that we start handling the situation the way it is. Now, um, hey, you know, yeah, let me, I'm almost done. I'll take questions. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, Twitter's a really powerful tool because if something's happening, some type of emergency or fire, or earthquake or whatever it is, you can just hashtag that, that event and you'll get real time updates of what's going on from everybody on the ground. So it's extremely powerful. And then what I do with Twitter is I tweet out um, weather data, weather graphs, um, you know, all sorts of things. So it's, it's a pretty powerful uh, program. And then if you want to go to my weather forecast, just send me an email to pgne weather at, at pgne.com and I'll put you in the weather forecast. Does anybody here get my weather forecast? And yes, so a few people do. Um, if you don't like it, fine, just let me know. Hey, John, can you unsubscribe me? I'm more than happy to take you off the list. So there, there you go. Okay, with that, I just want to say it's truly, it really is an honor for me to be able to speak to all of you. I'm, I'm kind of blown away by it. It's a huge group, and, and I'm, I'm really humbled by it. So thank you so much, and, and, and thank you to the AAUW and the library for sponsoring this. So there you go. Thank you. And with, that, um, with that, we'll take questions, and I'm going to do as a gentleman in the back, then I'll get to you, sir. Go, go ahead. And I'll get to the question about Diablo, too, because I know you answered that. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay, so you showed us the uh, example of the apple and then the skin being the atmosphere. Yes. Uh, could you give us some perspective over as to how that has changed? Uh, was it, how, how thick was it, you know? Yeah, so as the earth warms, the atmosphere warms, the thickness of the atmosphere also increases somewhat. It actually doesn't really do much of anything. It, it does, though, when you think about the 500 millibar analysis, 
and we measure that in decameters, that is starting to thicken a little bit. The thicker the atmosphere, the warmer it gets. But I haven't really um, seen any studies on that. But it's a great question, man. It's something I should research. But, but, but could that then just be what it's naturally? Uh, oh, yeah. It's been like that as long as we've been around. Okay. I, yeah. I, thought, I thought you were implying that it's gotten thinner. Oh, no. Oh, okay. What I'm saying that if you go up 276,000 feet and you're able to get up that high, bam, you get your NASA astronaut wings. So it's really not that, it's like going from here up to San Luis, you're, you know, you're an astronaut at that point. Just making the point how thin the atmosphere really is. All right, yes, sir. With the issue of the ocean level rising, yeah. what are your thoughts on seawalls and saltwater intrusion? Well, yeah, so, so the idea is if we have coastal erosion, shouldn't we put in seawalls and try to prevent, like, you know, of course, the classic example would be the Netherlands, right? where they've been doing this, you know, dikes and dams for forever. And I think right now with the Coastal Commission and Lands and the Lands Commission, I don't, I don't think they allow seawalls and boulders and that sort of thing, as far as I know, right? Um, th that's as much as I know. And then, of course, um, with the saltwater intrusion, you got to look at Miami and all those septic systems that are failing right now. Not good. So there, there you go. And then uh, any other questions? Some people hypothesize that may uh, cause more earthquakes, but I, I don't know. There, there you go. Okay, and I had a question here. Yes, sir. Are your presentation slides or graphs available online? You know what I could do? Um, I'll send this presentation to the AAUW and also to the library, and you can contact the AAUW in the library and get it. Would that work for you all? Okay. We'll, we'll do that. All right. And we'll, yeah, Gigi, go ahead. John, are you changing minds as we're out here speaking to people? I, sh I sure hope so. But, you know, I am. I, and this is why I, people come up to af to me after this presentation and go, I, I didn't know it was this, this bad or, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, in fact. Because, yeah, we're well, so welcome. All right, right here, the lady in red. Yeah, I mean, obviously, areas that. Yeah. How, how far will a drive affect our groundwater for the well guard? So the question was how far does sea level need to increase before it starts affecting uh, the aquifers mm -hmm. with wells? And it probably depends where you live. You know, I think of Los Osos. Probably not very much, but maybe other areas probably has to raise up quite a bit more. So for each general area, I really don't know, but but I'm sure it will. And then we had a question here. I think somebody had their hand up. Y yes, sir. Now my question is in reference to the uh, one picture of the Hot Apple Express from Trillard. Yeah. Is there any data that reflects whether there's been an increase in volume due to the temperature? Yep, I mean, Scripps has been really in the forefront. In meteorological circles, we say turning on the hose. But Scripps is really a leader in this. And I was talking with, uh, with the science lead, and, and she said, yeah. In fact, she spoke um, at the American Meteorological Conference in San Diego, and, and her data sort of really showed that they are getting worse. Part two. <laughs> yeah. Your personal opinion. Of its, uh, yeah. How is it going to affect the West Coast of okay. Well, I, I think if you look at all the models, the droughts will become more severe and more prolonged. I guess maybe it's kind of a same thing, right? But they'll be broken up by more intense rainfall events. And ARs are going to you know, factor into that um, in a big way. So there, there you go. Great, great question. All right, over here, Joe. Well, I, I said one thing, buy EVs and, and get solar panels. And then, um, you know, Joe is, is a big proponent of Diablo Canyon. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it breaks my heart. Um, Diablo Canyon is a magnificent facility. All the carbon that's ever been, that you need to use to build that facility, it's been expended, right? The, the power plant's been built, it's running. 
It's the biggest source of greenhouse free gas anywhere in, in California, and it breaks my heart that we're going to decommission. I, I can tell you one thing though, Joe, and this is senior management is very clear about this, we're going to operate that power plant with absolute excellence right to 24 and 25. We're not skimping on anything. In fact, we spent $110 million a few months ago to replace the stator in Unit 2 generator. So what we want people to say is how can you be closing this power plant down when it's the best ran, the safest, mm -hmm. and most reliable power plant in the entire world? That's our goal. But, but we are on the path of decommissioning. It's just the way it is. So anyway, there you go. Edith. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to the volcano? That's a, I don't know, but, but I knew, uh, I know this, that a lot of low-lying low areas are going to be in trouble. And a perfect example of that is Bangladesh, which is only a few feet above sea level. In fact, a lot of it's below sea level. And it's, it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And all those folks are going to either have to go to India or Pakistan to escape. And, and then those folks will be looking, you know, these are large human migrations. And that's going to be very problematic. Yeah, now you have the virus that broke out in, in China, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so if, if you want to visit the power plant, we have a tour program. And some of you have been on that, on that tour. Um, this, um, you have my email address. Write me an email, and I'll give you the website to sign up for a tour. So there, there you go. Yes, ma'am, in the back? Yes. Well, I think the, the Pacific Ocean is bigger. 